Good evening again, everyone. Welcome to the Irk Russell Show, a game against Middle Tennessee State. Irk, you said earlier in the week to the boosters, and it sounds like a coach's lament almost, but I think you made an excellent point in saying this is the most important game Georgia Southern's ever played. It's an interesting crossroads, isn't it? Well, it really is. It's, uh, it's more scary than it is interesting, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But uh, we're faced with the prospect of losing two football games in a row. Uh, we were hoping for a day like this weather-wise maybe a little bit warmer than it is. Uh, we got us a, a good uh, natty Statesboro hot day, and uh, our guys have been kind of pulling for that, so maybe that'll help us. I think our guys are ready to play. I don't know if, uh, if we're equal to the task of beating a good team like Middle Tennessee, but at least we've got another chance. That's the great thing about football. If it's not the last game, you got another chance the next week, and we've got one. They've had a week off to get ready for this game, and uh, we've had, we were kind of banged up in the middle of the line, I understand. Well, we lost uh, Charles Cochran to knee surgery, and that's not going to help our cause any because he was a mighty fine uh, offensive lineman. That leaves us with two starters back from last year for all practical purposes, Dennis Franklin and uh, Ronnie Warnock, and Warnock's really not in the best shape, but if, if he can play, that, that rascal will play as hard as anybody I've ever seen. What about uh, Middle Tennessee now? You've had a chance to, to uh, evaluate their game films. What do they look like to you? Well, again, it's right scary because anybody that can score 55 points on Tennessee State, <laughs> a team that's uh, perennially uh, in the top uh, in preventing points, is um, has got to be really good. They scored on their first eight possessions last week or a week before last, and um, they were virtually unstoppable. Every time they got a third and five or third and six, Collier, their quarterback, uh, would make something happen. He'd either scramble for the first down or find an open receiver. Uh, on defense, they play uh, a 60 defense. Uh, we have had some success in the past with our fullback inside. Let's hope that uh, we can find a crease or two for Joe Ross and hope that he can maybe break one. And you're trying a new quarterback, or at least a starting quarterback this week. I felt like Snake Burnett deserved an opportunity to to start this game and see how he can move the team. I really believe that we'll see Bullock along the way, and we may even see Raymond Gross. We, we're not going to hesitate to... Uh, to use whoever we think might be appropriate for the situation. Okay, Eric, looks like you got the weather you wanted and uh, the, the competition that uh, maybe you don't want, but at least it'll put us to the test today. Well, we've got an opportunity, Bill, and, and after all, if we can have a good opportunity just one more time, that's, that's all we ask. All right, get after See it. See you later. All right, and we'll be back with the first half highlight. When the Georgia Southern Eagles took the field Saturday, most experts gave them about as much chance of beating Middle Tennessee State as the Falcons have of winning Super Bowl XXII. As with all defensive struggles, this game started out slowly, at least on the surface. Jeff Banks and Tyrone Hull combined to stop Marvin Collier on an attempted pass play. And when Collier tried to scramble out of trouble on third and eight, he got only seven. Charlie Waller saw to that. But behind new starting quarterback Ken Burnett, the Eagles ran only two plays. When on second and seven, Burnett and fullback Joe Ross missed a handoff, and MTSU had the football at Southern's 49. On second and seven, Collier rolled out to his left and picked up 20 yards to the GSC 26-yard line. But the defense gelled shortly thereafter, forcing the Blue Raiders to go for three. Joe Leslie's 43-yard attempt was true blue, and the Eagles were behind three to nothing. On the kickoff, Gary Miller, after some initial problems of handling the pigskin at the 20-yard line, gave the Eagles good field position, getting 13 more yards up to the 33. On the third and sixth play, Burnett and Ernest Thompson got five of it, hooking up on this pass pattern. Then deciding to gamble early, the Eagles got a first down when Joe Ross gained the necessary yard, plus one more for Southern to keep possession. On second and 11 from their own 43, Burnett took the Eagle Express behind enemy lines with this 17-yard keeper down to the Blue Raider 40, but the Eagles were penalized for illegal procedure on the play. Therefore, on third and 11, two plays later, Burnett passed the Eagles out of trouble again, firing this 14-yard strike to Darren Chandler, who caught it at shoestring height. You'll notice as you watch again from the southern bench, the defenders didn't think it was a legal reception, but it was. Then it was fullback Joe Ross for a bunch, 13 to be exact, and the Eagles appeared on their way to the end zone. But on third and eight, Burnett's next flight was hijacked by linebacker Don Thomas, 
Burnett actually came over and forced Thomas to fumble on the run back, but as luck would have it, he fell right on top of the football, and the Blue Raiders began their second scoring drive of the afternoon. But the Eagle defense would make them earn every inch of Glenn Bryant field turf they covered yesterday. On first down, for example, watch number 54, defensive tackle Rod Eichler from Cedar Grove, New Jersey, put Marvin Collier on the ground while fighting off his offensive blocker. A loss of five yards on the play. But it seemed that revenge would be sweet for Mr. Collier when he uncorked a 40-yard strike to flanker Mike Pittman, who was covered like a blanket by Taz Dixon and Terry Young. How in the world he made this catch can be attributed only to divine intervention. Then a pitch outside to Gerald Anderson got nine more yards to the Southern 11, but then Eagle Pride took over and Divinity was left out of it. Anderson got a call on first down while James Wildman Carter submarined to hit him low. Flint Matthews blew by his blocker to hit him high. And the team who just two weeks ago had scored 41 points in the first half alone against Tennessee State had to settle for another field goal. And the first quarter ended with Middle Tennessee holding a 6-0 lead. Defensive coach Mike Healy liked the effort. Uh, we had a very good game plan going in there, but our defensive line uh, played uh, magnificently. That's all you can say about it. They had a quarterback back there that uh, threw the heck out of the ball against Tennessee State. Uh, when people were covered, he just put the ball down and took off and gained 15 or 20 yards. He's, uh, we thought he was just tremendous. And we told our defensive line in practice all week of trying to drive the offensive lineman back into his face and contain him. We felt containing was the most important thing and try to get our rush, have, be so close to him that he'd throw air and balls. And that's what happened to him. They got a few sacks and we were able to control the uh, line of scrimmage defensively and uh, eventually that's really what happened to them. They weren't able to have a lot of protection and uh, when that happened they were in trouble because they're, they're not going to run the ball on us. The Eagles lone scoring drive of the half began with 10.44 to go in the second period. The pitch to Gary Miller got 10 yards inside MTSU territory and on third and a dozen freshman Raymond Gross out of Bradwell Institute came off the bench and turned this into a nine yard gain by reversing his field. And on another fourth down gamble, fourth and three, Gross connected with Tony Belzer for 13 yards. And later, with Burnett back at the helm, to the dismay of some in the stands, it was down to the 15 on this play. But the drive ran out of gas, and on fourth and two from the seven, Tim Foley came in to boot a 25-yard field goal. And the Eagles went to the locker room, trailing by three. Quarter drought of not scoring a touchdown came to a merciful end early in the third period, courtesy of the opposition. Quarterback Marvin Collier pitched to Gerald Anderson on third and four, and the pitch went right through Anderson's hands, and a delighted Nay Young came up with the football for the Eagles. Is this kid happy or what? And the Eagle faithful, some 14,000-plus, second largest in Paulson Stadium history, cheered their approval. On third and five from the enemy 11, again we saw Raymond Gross at the helm. Gross hurtled his way to first down territory at the Blue Raider three, but out came Gross, and out came some of the boo birds in the stands, too. That's right. Um, Gross has some ability. He doesn't know our offense yet. Uh, we have to limit the, the plays that uh, that he can run because he simply hasn't lined up there and mastered our complete offensive repertoire. He's the best pure passer uh, that we have at quarterback. This is not to say that he knows where the receivers are and can handle our passing game but we put him in in those situations and to see what he could do. It was rough sledding to the end zone on fourth and goal from the one. Ernest Thompson got the call. He didn't get in, but he got the ball over. That's all that counts. It wasn't a popular decision with the MTSU defenders, and we know exactly how they feel. The Eagles still led 10 to 6, though. That seemed to fire up Rob Witten. His ensuing kickoff darn near left Bullet County. However, the Blue Raiders got the ball back when after recovering a fumble, Marvin Collier and Gerald Anderson atoned for their previous miscue, connecting on a 24-yard touchdown pass and a third-quarter downpour to make it 13-10 Blue Raiders. The defense continued to hold, and this nail-biter whittled down to the last two minutes and 32 seconds. Ken Burnett and company kept coming up with miracle after miracle. First, a 19-yard pass to Tony Belzer, up to the 41. Two plays later, Burnett connects with Darren Chandler for 12 more yards to the Middle Tennessee 47. And yet another miracle. When Burnett faded to pass a few plays later, his receivers were covered and he was forced to run. He was hit and coughed up the football, but center Dennis Franklin is Johnny on the spot for the home team to keep the drive alive. Then came fourth down and nine. This was the ball game. 
and Burnett fires to a wide open Herman Barron for 18 yards, and Herman couldn't believe it either. The coach, I guess, had confidence in me the last minute of the game put me in, and I made, came through, luckily. Do you suppose that maybe they weren't uh, looking for you on that play? They had maybe Bells are covered, maybe some other guys? Maybe they would. I think maybe they would probably uh, go into the wide receivers more. They was looking more toward them. That, I just kind of eased that and opened them all along. <laughs> Frank Johnson was the next target. 12 more yards down to the 16, and by now, the crowd was in an industrial strength frenzy. Then Joe Ross up the middle to the two. Southern called their final timeout with 30 ticks left on the clock. The Eagle Express couldn't be stopped now. Burnett running the option to perfection, faked out the defensive lineman just long enough to leave Joe Ross wide open at the corner, and the Eagles put the whipped cream on this touchdown Sunday, and Ross said, what a shot in the arm. We needed that. I mean, we, first two games, we just, first game, we, last week, I mean, we was down just like this, same situation, last drive of the game, and we didn't come out. And this time, we knew we had to come out this time. The victory was assured moments later when Nay Young, last week's scapegoat, became this week's hero, intercepting Conyers' final pass of the afternoon and darn near scored. Georgia Southern hangs on to win, 17-13. Urkel have... Well, the Middle Tennessee State game played at Paulson Stadium today had to be one of the most exciting, not only one of the biggest victories, I think, in history, Eric, but one of our, uh, probably the best game we played at Paulson Stadium. Could be. Um, I, I still think Middle Tennessee has a very good football team, and this is so different from other Georgia Southern uh, Mitsu games. Usually the, the score, like last, last year, 34 to 31, 28 to 21, this was a, a classic defensive struggle. Um, personally, I don't really care whether it's a defensive struggle or a shootout. <laughs> Just as long as we win the game, and we did that, but it must have been a heck of a game for people to watch. It was uh, an exciting game for, for people on the sideline to watch. I thought our defense played a super game uh, with just one or two exceptions, almost a perfect game. Our secondary covered well until our full rush could put some pressure on Collier. He wasn't able to scramble like he has scrambled on us in the past. And we made that great drive with two and a half minutes left to play. It was a lot like last week, uh, the situation. We were able to capitalize today as uh, last week we weren't. And I appreciate your being here. Yes, sir. My because uh, <laughs> you weren't there last week. And we got to thinking about all the reasons why we didn't win and came up with, when you're not there, we're going to turn over or lose six fumbles and lose the game. So please, please, <laughs> come next week. Yes, sir. Now, we've got, uh, this had to be a, uh, you, you said it was a crucial, it had to be a crucial point of the season for us, and, and this could really set the tone from, from here on out. Well, Bill, I don't, it, it means that, uh, that we're two and one instead of one and two, and it gives us a shot in the arm for, in preparation for probably the best team on our schedule, at least Carolina. Uh, I'm not sure that it's gonna have any effect on us when we get on that field next week, but it's gonna <laughs> help us a great deal in preparation. It's gonna, uh, it's a shot in the arm for our people to get ready to play again. Again, you said that the defense uh, performed well today, and against a team that had a week to prepare and scored 55 points against uh, Tennessee State as good as they are. Yeah, they uh, they had opportunities to do a lot of different things in, in their week off. They really didn't do much that we didn't expect. Uh, sometimes I'm not sure that a week off is, is real good for people, except to get folks well if they're hurt. You know, I look at that with mixed emotion uh, as to whether it's a valuable situation or not. But regardless, our guys came to play. It was obvious in, Tuesday, in Monday's practice that they had their minds and their hearts set on this game. And you saw it. That's the way they played. Our congratulations today, Eric. Good luck against East Carolina ne next week. Thank you, Bill, and I look forward to seeing you at the East Carolina game. <laughs> okay. We'll look forward to seeing you folks back with us again next week, and we'll bring you the highlights of the East Carolina game.